Hello and welcome. I'm Bob Lichter and I will be interviewing individuals for Kenosha Voices, an oral history project for the Kenosha County Historical Society in conjunction with Kenosha Community Media. I am a member of the Kenosha History Center and have volunteered there since 2015. We hope that you will enjoy these programs. I'm with Keith and Lance Pauley, current and retired employee of FAMCO Corporation in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Hello and welcome. Thank you. How, how were you hired at FAMCO? How did the, the application process go? For myself, it was I was a gas jockey at the local gas station and the owner and the supervisor had an account with the gas station, so I was their kid that pumped the gas and checked their oil and cleaned their windows. And the supervisor liked me, the owner liked me, and they said, when you're 18, come see me. On my 18th birthday, I showed up okay, and what, started three days later. Okay, what, what year did you start with uh, FAMCO? It was 1977. Okay. And you're retired from FAMCO? I retired in December fully. I've been part-time for a couple years. Okay. Yeah, I, I consult with them a little bit and help out because I've had a lot of years there. So, But uh, still care about FAMCO. It's a part of my life. and part of my family. They've been good to me and I want to make sure that they're around for my son's sake and just everybody else that works there. They're all my friends and mm -hmm. good people. Keith, how about you? How long have you uh, been there? Uh, and 15 years. 15 years. Uh, he called me when I was 22. I was working for an alarm company in Chicago and I planned on moving to Chicago and after working in Chicago for about a year I kind of changed my mind so when he called me and asked me if I'd be interested in working with him I, I jumped at the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's been a blessing. Okay, excellent. Uh, what uh, types of products or services does FAMCO provide? Well, the, the oldest part of the product would be our arbor presses uh, for pressing motors, armatures, uh, crimping wires, anything like that. They have a variety of sizes, tabletop to stand standalone arbor presses, uh, shearing machines for cutting mm -hmm. metal and plastic. can go into a sheet metal shop and have a back gauge where you can cut your length for your ducting or something you're going to do. And the big bread and butter these days is production shears for cutting metal and plastic, extrusion lines, coil lines, what, whatever they need, we build custom shears. That's been our niche in the market. Uh, to my understanding, we're the only USA manufacturer still making a custom machine. Okay. In the market or your customers are where? They're all over the world. Um, typically, the United States, but they're Canada, Europe. We've shipped mm -hmm. shears everywhere. Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. All from Kenosha. All from mm -hmm. Kenosha, yeah. Okay. Lance, when you started in 1977, what did you make an hour? I was making $3.50 an hour, and it wasn't near what the other factories were paying, but we worked a lot of overtime, and it made up the difference. I was able to get married, start a family, and life began. Okay, so wages and benefits were satisfactory? It, it was decent benefits and wages were good enough to make ends meet and the working atmosphere was great. It was a day shift only and all the people there were good friends and we got a lot of camaraderie and and really worked out well. Okay. Is that a union shop or is that? No, no, no union. Okay. The owner did not want a union in his shop and was adamant that we're not doing it or we're going to close the doors. Okay. Um, were you originally from Kenosha? I was born and raised in okay. Kenosha. Yeah. Okay, and what were the jobs that you had at FAMCO throughout your career then? I started out as a machinist helper, basically an apprenticeship, not state indentured, but I learned from a gentleman for four years, what he did on all the milling centers I worked, vertical and horizontal milling, old machinery, no CNC, the manual setup, and learned all the product line, and then he passed away, and I took over that whole area, and did pinions, hobbing, turning, anything that was needed in the machine shop, and I was able to grow with the company and learn to be an assembler, did that for a bunch of years and then crossed over into supervision and then into sales and I know that there's many parts of the company I haven't been involved in. Okay. How about Keith? How about you? Uh, I, I started training as a machinist. Uh, still, still do machining but then uh, after about I think two years of working there 
the, the welder, they had one welder in the shop, uh, he, he was ready for retiring. So they had me train with him for a year on welding and then they sent me to Gateway to, to learn you know, the trade through that and I've been their welder for the last 13 years. Okay, wow. Well. So what was the typical, each of you, a typical day like? Check in in the morning, you said one shift so you never had yeah. to work yeah. night shift? Yeah, I used to open up, so I would come in and get all the lights on and compressor running and make sure everybody was lined up for the day and kind of organize what parts that we're going to be trying to make that day. And then other people would come in and change everything. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the way it works, you know. It's like somebody calls and it's like all of a sudden there's a new fire to put out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then my job was just working with all the guys from... Machine shop, the assembly, the paint room. I trained all the assemblers. I trained a lot of the machinists. And everyone, yeah. And kind of went on from that route. And so you might have had to do several different things in one day, depending oh, on absolutely. that. Oh, absolutely. Any of our days were varied. You'd, you'd, you would thought you were coming into something, and it was okay. a whole other day once it, it started. The phone rings, and it changes everything. And we, we have a... Uh, uh, very small group of employees now, so everyone has to wear a lot of hats. And, you know, everyone yeah. has to be able to run multiple machines. Yeah, very and, versatile crew. Yeah. So, Famco, I believe, started in 1952 in Kenosha? 55 was okay, when 55. they moved to Kenosha. So over the years, like from the 70s to current, you know, how many employees typically would have been it, there? It started out when I was there. There was probably a dozen guys out in the shop, and then it slowly grew because business got bigger. Government contracts were very plentiful back then, and we were making a lot of machines. All the ships and aircraft carriers all have FAMCO machines on them. I've talked to people all over the world on ships for parts and wow. things to help them. But um, it just kind of went that way, and then I kind of lost where I'm at. Well, so okay. when, when you were managing, uh, okay. uh, you said there was, what, maybe 30? Oh, yeah, then we went up to 38 people in the shop. And then there was and people in the office and as well, then there was engineers. Yeah, and okay. a lot of engineers because we had three product lines that came into the business. Okay. Did, were there certain work rules you had to buy it by or safety rules? <laughs> well, we, we pushed for having safety glasses and steel toe shoes and try to work in a safe environment. If you found something that you didn't think was safe, we would discuss it and try to correct it. But uh, it was a good crew and we were very trusting and they were safe in their matters. We had very few injuries and okay. through the years it's been real good. So if an employee felt there was an unsafe condition or a quality concern, then who would that person go to? They would go to me as okay. the supervisor when I was in my term of supervision and then before then we had other supervisors we would see and then the owner we would talk to him he was open you could still can talk yeah. to him as yeah. as you have a problem or question he's very obtainable okay what about over those years since the 70s uh changes in technology world events management decisions how did that maybe affect your jobs there. technology has really grown a lot we didn't advance a whole lot there because our equipment worked well and mm -hmm. we have a few cnc machines came in but nothing that would produce for other people we just do our own product and 9-11 was a blow for everybody as you all know i mean that kind of shut us down for a minute and wow. the economy hit us a few times where yeah. we had everybody laid off down to me out in the shop, I would take an order, I'd make the part, and I'd ship the part. I mean, it was it was a tough time. Right, right, right after I started, uh, we hit that big re recession. So we, we spent a lot of time laid off. Um, actually, it was, it was nice. We, we did a lot of building maintenance during that time. Uh, yeah. Spent a lot of time up on the roof, fixing the roof. Yeah. Whole summers, just months, time, just yeah. fixing the roof. Yeah, everybody learned how to be a roofer for a few <laughs> years. Okay, well. Got to do what needs it, to be done. It, right? yeah, that's the kind of shop it is, is everybody yeah. does what they need to do yeah. to keep it going because they cared, mm -hmm. care. What about, how did you get to work? Did you drive, walk? I, live I lived close enough I probably could have walked, but I always <laughs> drove or rode a motorcycle and um, bicycle at times. I think there was even a time or two we rode unicycles to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And All right. Um, a typical day, so you 
started any city logging on a computer was there ever a time clock punching a time in card? my period and yeah. day there was a time clock that we jobbed in or we clocked in on a time card and then we had work cards that were on a wall in the production manager's office of all the machines and all the jobs that had to be run for that month and we would the production manager would line them up and say this is your machine and this is how the order I want you to run them and okay he, it worked, production manager back then was an amazing guy. He he was very, knew every part, knew everything where it was. Like Ken? No, it was, oh. Ted Eichner was oh. his name, and okay. he was, he knew the everything. I mean, he. Okay. So a typical day, too, you punch in or log in, you work, was there a break, lunch break? Yeah, we, we had a buzzer at the time, and at okay. 9 o'clock we'd get a 10-minute break, and sometimes we would squeeze a little extra out of it, and <laughs> lunch hour you'd get to wash up five minutes early, and have a half an hour lunch and you know back then the bars had food so we would run over to the main event or beer gardens or wherever for lunch and might have a beverage or two and I remember I'd take half days at school sometimes and I'd walk over to the main event and he'd be in there yeah he'd get me okay. some chicken strips and I'd play the pinball machine yeah absolutely All right. um, what about do you have any memories of certain jobs or products or interesting assignments you worked on perhaps? Oh, that brass tabernacle. I, I made a, for a Greek church in Racine, I was contracted from one of the owners to make a taber tabernacle that would go on the altar to hold the sacrament host and I cut all bricks out of sheet brass out of by hand and um, it was an honor to make it. It's still part of the Greek church today that's at the altar. And I, it was, I actually made a good friend that polished it from, um, oh, I can't think of the brass place, or the polishing place, Irving Polishing. And oh, yeah. Mike, Mike Worwe there is a good friend of mine, and I contracted him, and he's become a good friend since. I still mm -hmm. see him and ride with him. Okay. What about your work group as far as relationships? with the workers in the shop and the management? It's, it's very close. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's always been a really good work situation as far as management and shop, and as far as I'm concerned, being in management, it was, I tried to listen to everybody and I would never ask anybody to do anything I wouldn't do myself, pretty much, mm -hmm. that was my philosophy. Okay, so did the work group get close, you know, friend, friendship? Oh, yeah, oh, we, yeah, we had very, very company tight. picnics and things when oh. we were larger. We had um, Christmas parties that were pretty much a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And, you yeah. know, things shrunk down, so you don't do a lot of that anymore. But we still have pizza days yeah. and yeah. Okay. things like that. I just made a part for a local restaurant, and they appreciated it, and they sent over pizzas yeah. on a Friday for us. Nice. All right. Um, so anything with, with Christmas parties, you said, any bowling teams or softball teams or anything no, like that? No, they really never Smaller. got into okay. the sports aspect. We had a few softball games as a group where we'd go out to an empty ball diamond and try to pretend we were softball players, <laughs> but uh, it was fun to just get out. And uh, mm -hmm. the big thing at work back then was playing cards. We would, at break time or lunch or... After work, we'd play guts and poker, and for hours after the shift was done, just because we had fun hanging out doing it. What about, um, do you think about the best part of your, each, each of you can answer it in your own way, the best part about working, your, your career there working at Famco? For me, I would say it was a satisfaction of seeing parts go from raw to finished and turning out beautiful for a customer and having them have a trouble-free product that pride in USA as we all have mm -hmm. and kind of stood, stood behind it and still do today of care about what we make and what the customer gets and just seeing a finished product knowing that they were going to have good use with it for whatever situation. Now with production machines going 24-7 that they run and they're Durable and good. I mean, we're, I'm proud of them. Do any of your customers or clients ever come to Kenosha? And mm -hmm. We tour? do have customers yeah. come in and tour and see the facility, and yeah. absolutely. Okay, Keith, how about you? What's the best part? Uh, 
uh, there's been a lot of flexibility uh, with, with my schedule, uh, letting me take off for, I'm, I'm a musician, so they let me take off the tour sometimes, and uh, so that, that's been a big perk, and uh, just having a, a pretty close relationship with the, with the owner and the management there, uh, it's nice, you know, they came to my wedding, and they, I get cards for my kid on his birthday, and it's just, it's, it's, it's almost like a second family. Yeah, it's they're very caring. Okay, what about the, maybe the most challenging part of it, or stressful, or maybe a negative part of it? Anything over the years pop up on that? For me, it was two weeks into being a supervisor, OSHA visited and said, we need to do an inspection, and I had nothing from the previous supervisor. He had passed away and didn't have time to set things up, and I found all about having material safety data sheets up to date, um, OSHA injury logs and injury and safety training and I had none of that down and it was a great group of people that helped me get it done and we were able to abate with OSHA and drop our fines significantly and had a, had a safer shop at that point. Mm -hmm. Definitely it was uh, the right to know and all the other things that yeah kind of made the place better. Okay. Keith, any uh, challenges? Challenging? Um, you know, I, like I said, when I started there, it was it was uh, the, the Great Recession, so you have to try to find things to do sometimes, sure. you know, and they, they were pretty good about letting us, you know, get up on the roof or make building repairs or even sometimes just doing little odd jobs for the owner, you know, I fixed his mailbox and stuff like that. Cool. And uh, Lance, you, you retired in, in 2019, was it? No, but then you're still I, I've been part-time for a few years mm -hmm. and then officially retired in December last year. And now I do a little bit of consulting for them. They're kind enough to bring me back to do some machine repair. And unfortunately, COVID took one of our machinists and yeah. we haven't been able to hire anybody. Oh. So... At that time, I came back and did some of the fill-in work that because I knew all the jobs there on that, and I've been doing that. And now we've hired a couple people mm -hmm. part-time since, so okay. I've been working with them, and they're doing a wonderful yeah. job. Yeah, that seems in, in 2022, it's a challenge for a lot of businesses getting employees. Does Famco uh, recruit or? We we have actually tried temp services and had no luck with that. Uh, people that their sending just didn't have the skills, it didn't work, we let a lot go. I learned how to let people go at that point, which is mm -hmm. was a tough one for me. I'm a kind soul that doesn't like to let yeah. people go, but I learned to because you have to. Mm -hmm. And so it was tough and uh, we have a sign on our fence of we're hiring and I think that kind of helped prompt and then word of mouth always helped when mm -hmm. you knew somebody. I, when I first started, we had half of my graduating class, I swear, worked at FAMCO. Mm -hmm. I mean, there must have been six or eight of us that graduated with me. Mm -hmm. And one is still there. Okay. A good friend, oh, yeah. Ed Rosinski. I, I work with him all the time. We're good friends. We talk all the time. Okay. Any other little anecdotes or uh, interesting stories from over the years, you know, relationship wise or work wise? Any other? interesting projects that you want to share anything about? Or? I, I got to work on the owner's cars quite often. Yeah. He, had yeah. a, he had a 57 Corvette that I kept Ooh. running for him and okay. before I retired he wanted me to get it running again so he could sell it and I did and he did. So that was kind of fun. I always enjoy cars and it's one of my hobbies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you never know who's going to pop, pop in the doors and need mm -hmm. something fixed sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. if people uh, from the hardware store, I've had to straighten augers for them and uh, fixed a few trailers for people and just various things that people are like, oh, you got a machine shop, can you can you fix this, or yes. build this? And um, we have the skilled people that can do it. I so mean. you go from all these worldwide large projects to somebody walking in with a... Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it is a part of the community and I think, you know, we've always enjoyed that aspect Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Like our yeah. doors are open, come on in. And I, we can try to help you. I've, I've offered um, with the radio spot a couple years ago with a local radio, Lou Regani. Oh. Um, he cool. was talking about FAMCO and I actually called him up and spoke to him while he was on the air and I offered if anybody wanted a tour, I'd be happy to show them around and the offer's still out there if anybody 
would want a tour while I'm there, or if Keith's there, I'm sure he would give him a good tour too. But uh, that yeah, cool. that would be fun. It's like an operating in a in a museum, but we still function. Sure. You should tell them about the the Lord's Prayer pen that we have. Yeah, we we do have a piece that came from one of the companies that Famco acquired called Gordon Manufacturing. It came out of Racine, and they have the Lord's Prayer engraved on the point of a pin in a display case with a microscope, so you can actually see it because it is the thickness of your hair that the whole Lord's Prayer is engraved in a circle. And we and, have engravers in the shop and, that and are, were used. We for, have the masters that was used to make that, and we have a, in our conference room, we have a old impanograph that was done using, done on that process, and that was done in the 30s. And it's, it's just a marvelous piece. What, how would that be done? What, what would be used? They actually etched it, they couldn't use it cutter to mm -hmm. cut that small but they etched it and they actually had to shut down all the street cars back then because any vibration would have affected it so while they were doing the Lord's Prayer they had all the quiet on the street because any vibration would have messed it up but it was wow. done on a machine that they made that was for sale it wasn't like it wasn't a quality machine that they had to spruce up or anything mm -hmm. it was the way they made things okay well I thank you for uh, sharing your story um, on behalf of the Kenosha History Center and Kenosha Community Media. Thanks again. Oh, you're so welcome. It was a nice to be a part of it. It was nice to get to meet you. And the Kenosha Museum is a wonderful place, the historic Absolutely. museum, and enjoy that immensely. And I've been there a number of times. And Thanks. You, right. you guys, kudos to you guys. You All do right. a wonderful job. Thank you.